Hello, we're going to talk about dissociation of ionic compounds. Now, an interesting story on this. I taught at the University of Utah for six years under this wonderful professor, Dr. Butch Atwood. Um, he had done years and years of research on how students learn chemistry, and he found out something super interesting about dissociating ionic compounds from millions and millions, literally, of data points, um, looking at students' tests, college tests from around the United States, if students could dissociate ionic compounds, there was a 99% chance they would get an A in the class. So if you understand this concept, you are well on your way to being successful in chemistry. So here it is at the very, very foundation. Dissociate, that means break. An ionic compound is a compound that has a metal and a non-metal. Remember that non-metal could be a group of non-metals, a polyatomic ion. Um, at the very basis, you are going to dissociate, break apart the cation and the anion, but here's something special. You've got to count how many you have of those. You need to have the correct number of cations and anions. So the best way to show you this is honestly, just jump in and do it. Uh, so I have a list of some examples here. We're going to take a potassium chloride and we're going to dissociate this, break it into the cation and the anion. Um, so the cation, remember the first element's always going to be the metal, and that is the cation, the positive charge. So this potassium, K, is a plus one. Now two ways that I know that. Number one, it's from understanding the periodic table, that potassium right there is a plus one charge. Um, second way, you can cross the charges, uh, or the, the um, subscripts back up and those are the charges. Um, so let me show you that. It's understood that calcium has a one and chlorine has a one. I have one calcium, one chlorine. Well, if I take those numbers and cross them back up, that means that one was with that potassium and the one was with the chlorine. The cation is always written first, that's your metal, and the anion is always written second. Now, a little disclaimer. I said the metal's are always written first. There's one cation that's not a metal. It's a polyatomic, and that would be ammonia. You just need to have that memorized, that ammonia is a plus one cation. Otherwise, cations will always be metal, and the cations are always written first. It's just our convention, the way that we write it. Okay, so I have a potassium and a chloride ion. Now, how many do I have of each? Well, you come back here and this will tell you. I have one potassium and I have one chlorine, which means I have two total ions, two ions on that. Um, now, where do we use this? Why are you even doing this? There are three places, really common places that you'll use it. For net ionic equations, that is huge. When you have double replacement reactions, acid-base reactions, um, you always write the net ionic equation. And if you don't know what that is, watch the video on net ionic equations. It's going to be under the chemical reaction playlist. Um, next, colligative properties. You have to count how many particles there are. It's your I symbol. Um, so here my I would equal two. Uh, so very important with colligative properties. If you need to look that up, look under the playlist for solutions. And then next, Molarity of ions. Sometimes you'll be asked, what is the molarity of the ions? Because potassium chloride is soluble. It will completely dissolve in water. Um, so if that, watch this. If this is a 0.5 molar solution, and they want to know molarity of the ions, well, if I have one potassium chloride, for every one potassium chloride, it produces two ions. That means that we would have double the molarity. I would have a one molar for ions, a one molar for ions. Um, let me walk you through that because you maybe just don't, what? Okay, think about this. Let's say that I have one potassium chloride. I've only got one of these. How many ions would I have? Two. What if I have a dozen? What if I have 12 of those? So I have 12 potassium chloride. How many ions would I have? 24. I'd have 12 potassium and 12 chlorine. Um, so what if I have one mole? What if I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 of these compounds? How many ions will I have? Well, twice as much, I'll have two moles. So it's a one 
to two ratio for every one compound, it produces two ions. So if I have 0.5, multiply that by two, and we would have one molar. Okay, so that's the third place that you'll see this. Okay, so let's keep counting. Let's keep breaking, dissociating these apart. Calcium. So calcium, we know from the periodic table, is a plus two. There we go. Has two valence electrons to become an ion. Have the stability of a full octet. It's going to be isoelectronic with argon. It becomes a plus two charge. So plus two. And then we're going to have a fluoride ion. Again, looking at the periodic table. Fluorine is a minus one. If you want, you can cross those uh, subscripts back up. Check it out. There's the two and there's the one. The metal's always positive, the non-metal's always negative, my cation and anion. Now, how many do I have of each? Well, we've got one potassium, or one calcium, excuse me, and two fluorines. Now, let's take this a step further. I wanna draw this in a particulate form. So I drop this in water and it's going to dissolve, going to dissolve, going to dissolve, excuse me. So we'll have the calcium and then I'll have two fluorines. And those three ions will be floating in the water, surrounded by the water. Um, so this is going to give us a total of three ions, one calcium and two fluorides. Okay, let's keep going. A lithium nitride. So the charge on lithium is Li plus one. The charge on nitrogen is a minus three. Now you think about it, how many do I have of each of those? Well, this is going to have three lithiums. So I'm going to have one, two, three lithiums floating in water and one of that nitride ion. Now we just added up. How many total ions do we have? Four. Four ions. Three lithium and one nitride. Ooh, nice. I put a polyatomic in here. Can you remember polyatomics? This is SO4, the sulfate. That is a group a group together that will not dissociate because it's covalent. It's going to be um, a covalent bond, a different type of bonding. So that stays together. You cannot break apart the polyatomics when ions dissociate. Remember, you break apart the cation and the anion, and that whole group, the SO4, that is the anion. You can't break this into sulfur and oxygen. It stays together as sulfur and oxygen together as a sulfate. So when this dissociates into its cation and anion, we're going to have aluminum is a three plus. And again, let me show you the periodic table. There it is, we're going to lose three electrons. Um, if I cross the charge back up, check it out. There it is, the three. And you could look up, so for my students, I have a polyatomic reference on the back of their periodic table. You might have a polyatomic reference. You could look it up on Google or the easy thing, just take that two, cross that back up, and you've got SO4 minus two. Sulfate is a minus two. Maybe you have it memorized. Um, okay, now how many do I have of each? The subscripts will tell you. How many aluminums do I have? we're going to have two aluminum ions. And then how many sulfate, um, how many sulfate ions do I have? Three, three. So if these are floating in water, I'd have an Al3+, plus, Al3+, plus. and I'm drawing this really structured. It's not going to be organized by, like this by any means. Those are gonna be moving and floating inside the, moving and dissolved, surrounded by the water, all over inside the water. But that's what we have. How many total ions do we have? Two plus three is five. One, two, three, four, five. There's your five ions. So this will be five ions. Okay, glucose, straight up trick. I've gotten all kinds of answers from students on this. That does not dissociate. Why? It's because those are all non-metals. This is not an ionic compound. So this will be considered as one particle. The water will surround one glucose, and then the water surrounds another glucose and another glucose. But the glucose itself does not break into carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. It's one particle, one particle. Um, so big takeaway on this, anything that is covalent stays together as one particle. So covalent will always be the one particle. 
Okay, now these were ones that you got to see um, before I, I showed you. I wanna give you two more practice ones. Let's do a calcium nitrate. Okay, look at that. You're going to dissociate it into the cation and anion. What has the positive charge? What has the negative charge? Easiest way to do it, cross those charges back up. That's understood to be a one. So calcium is a two plus. Ooh, nitrate. That's a minus one. And you could check both of those. Look at a polyatomic table. Look at the periodic table. Now, how many do you have of each? We've got one calcium and two nitrates. So how many total ions? Three. We've got three. Let's do another one. Um, let's do um, a magnesium phosphate. Okay, magnesium phosphate. We're going to drop this in water. Um, and let's say that it completely dissociates, okay? Completely breaks apart. What are the ions? Okay, my metal, magnesium, and that's a two plus. Bring that two up here. The three goes up here to the phosphate. You could double check that on a polyatomic table. And now how many do we have of each? I've got three magnesiums and two phosphates. Very cool, five ions. We've got a total of five ions. Um, wow, so thinking colligative properties, the more ions we have, the more particles we have, the greater the power, the influence of the colligative property. That would be a great one, five ions. And uh, here, this one also had five ions. That would be awesome. Okay, very good. Take some time to chew on that. Again, the basis is break into cation and anion. And how many do you have of each of those ions? You've got it. And you've got the A in the class. Keep working hard. You're doing great. Thanks.